in this spirit that I am so glad each of you are here this evening and we welcome you to this forum and this space to discuss ways in public safety and the surrounding community can coexist. I challenge us all to spend time reflecting on what Dr. King stood for, which was tolerance, equality, mm -hmm. justice, respect, and interdependence, yeah. and where and how these qualities play a role in our personal as well as our professional lives. This space has been designed to promote collaboration and transparent communication as a means of improving all of our lives and quality of life. I heard someone say recently, we must, we must remember that our place in the world is a product of the hard and ethical work of our collective communities. Now to make this happen, we must pursue intentional and many times difficult conversations so we together can support and uplift each other in our struggle toward mutualistic endeavors and goals. Now I read this quote from a student uh, named Sergio Rodriguez who was talking about the day of service and what it meant to him and he said, when I think of Dr. King, I think about a world rooted in radical love and community care. I think about a man who accomplished much by working with allies across ideological divides. A man who looked to find strength in our differences as we work as a community to our justice. Martin Luther King was a bad man. That's all I <laughs> <laughs> Our conversation today is the beginning of what I envision as an ongoing conversation that moves us to our justice and an equality existence, and that can happen. So the next person that you're gonna hear at this podium, and I have the pleasure of calling her up, is Kathleen Shields Anderson, who is the public safety like vice said, president. Uh, yes, Kathleen. <laughs> Thanks, Colleen, and uh, thanks to uh, uh, Darren and um, to Dr. Allen for inviting us to, to come and participate in this program tonight. Um, we've been planning this for how long? Months. So, uh, months. Mm -hmm. um, and um, uh, so we decided to kind of make this conversation just about how we build community um, part of the MLK Symposium. Um, we thought it would be a great opportunity. And so we've been planning it forever. Um, and I'm looking around the room and I'm seeing a lot of our uh, high community and our university of CMS up with community members who work with a lot and she definitely showing up. Um, and then uh, Tyree and um, Colleen and Valerie and Gary and Stacey and Papa call on Monday um, and uh, say we cannot see what we all saw on Friday night. And um, uh, many people saw on Friday night and not, not come to this conversation without that. And, and um, so I appreciate everyone allowing us to pivot a little bit tonight um, uh, and um, I'm a little bit of a conversation. Um, and so I just wanted to, to read to open a uh, statement that we um, uh, posted on our website. Um, in response to what we saw. Um, and um, just so you have an understanding of, of kind of where we are um, as we're all processing what's going on in this decision process. And then I will give the space um, for, uh, I'm sure we'll share a great conversation. So on Friday evening, Chief Gary Williams and I sat in my office and we watched together the footage and you can do that. Uh, Tyree Nichols, the hands of five by the police officer. Much like George Floyd, Tyree's calls for his mother in those moments of suffering cannot help but leave us and others with a sense of heartache and horror. We offer our condolences to Tyree's family and loved ones in this time of loss and pain. As you may know, all five officers have been fired by the Memphis Police Department, charged with murder, and remain in custody. We, like many, look forward to the swift and fair outcome of this case. The actions of these officers are an affront to the mission of our division and to that of the dedicated law enforcement officers everywhere. They shape the trusting relationship to be work to build 
and maintain each and every day through our actions and our words. We remain committed to hiring and retaining the best for our community, as well as investigating and appropriately discipline any actions counter to our code of conduct, our policies, and our safety. Safety is a feeling. Mm -hmm. And we will continue to review our policies to ensure they reflect our commitment to fair enforcement of the law. We work diligently to ensure that our officers are well supervised and trained on de-escalation. Um, and I talked a little bit, we talked a little bit about some of our, the training that you'll hear um, Chief Williams talk about. Later. We will continue to provide our officers uh, as well with the support and resources they need to ask for help. <laughs> We will continue to listen and build our relationships with our men in Philadelphia for our commitment to inclusion, transparency, support, and to treating all people with dignity and respect. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for that message. Uh, my name is Dan Tolliver, I'm the Associate Director of the African American Resource Center. I uh, just want to say a few things before we get to, get to our panelists. Uh, that this is uh, such a great um, gathering for us to be here to have these kind of discussions. Um, so we're going to talk about things that we can do with partner and make sure that we have a very safe and vibrant community, um, not just within Penn, but beyond Penn as well. Uh, so let's get started. Uh, I want to talk about all our moderator first. Uh, the moderator, Dr. Rowling Gosgallon, who is a BA in criminology from Indiana University in Pennsylvania. And she also holds a MSW and a DSW from the University of Pennsylvania School of Social Policy and Practice. That's right. Uh, her dissertation entitled Educational Entertainment as an Intervention for Adolescents Exposed to Community Violence is published online at Request of Scholarly Commons. Uh, she has also co written articles with Dr. Phil Solomon on the same topic for multiple peer reviewed journals. They combined have a chapter in a textbook entitled Police and the Unarmed Black Male Crisis Currently. Crisis. Currently, she's the director and my boss at the African American <laughs> Research Center. Uh, and she is put. And Dr. Allen is focused on addressing the needs and the interests of the Penn community and improving the quality of life for the faculty and staff. That's her passion. And of course, working with students uh, with a particular focus on the African diaspora. She's been a lecturer at the uh, Rutgers University of School of Social Work. She's a lecturer here at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, she's been in the field of practice. Uh, she's been a practice supervisor for Penn and Temple University Graduate School uh, of social work students, and she serves as the president and murder of the immersion of the Association of Black Women in Higher Education. And as a fellow, she's at the Center for Public Center Initiatives, and she is an associate of the Philadelphia Collaborative Violence Prevention Coalition. She does a lot. Yeah. Very passionate worker. And she's also a, a member of Delta Sigma Theta. It's very good at it. You're telling me, right? <laughs> Thank God. I don't know, man, after all of that. <laughs> good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. I'm going to put this um, mic on. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. So I'm really um, pleased to be here. I'm not happy to be here um, because of the incident involving Tyree Hensel. So the fact that you're once again having to sit with the pain that that causes um, our community. Um, I want to thank. Vice President uh, Shields Anderson for the statement that she read mm -hmm. and her and she Williams' immediate response to the violence in that video. Mm -hmm. I haven't watched it yet. I could not bring myself to listening to another Black man cry for his mother. Uh, it was just too much to take. 
So as was already mentioned, we wanted to pivot a little bit. Um, and I'm going to ask um, uh, Chief Gary Williams to come up and join me as <laughs> Yeah. I'm gonna have a okay, I'm gonna have a conversation with him about uh some of the things that Vice President Shields Anderson said and his thoughts about the video. Then I'll invite the rest of the panelists up. Let me tell you a little bit about uh, Chief Williams. Gary Williams, a 21-year veteran of the University of Pennsylvania Police Department was selected to serve as chief of police following an extensive search. And that just had to win. Oh, it feels like yesterday. <laughs> uh, Williams joined Penn in 2001 after spending four years with the Philadelphia Police Department. He has held the Sergeant Patrol, Executive Lieutenant and Captain of Patrol positions serving on the Accident Safety Review Board, Emergency Response Team, UPPD Bike Unit, Police Athletic League Commander. And I think I just read that the Police Athletic League is having an anniversary today, 60 years. Wow. Yeah. Um, and the Community Response Unit. Prior to his appointment as Chief of Police, Gary's accomplishments at Penn include the development of the Strategic Crime Prevention, West End Grid Patrol, time spent as Emergency Response Team Commander, and Division of Public Safety Union Negotiation Team Member. His certifications include National Nuclear Security Administration, Philadelphia Police Department Crime Scene Investigations, GBI Law Enforcement Executive, Public Agency Training Council, and U.S. Department of Homeland Security and Field Force Extraction Tactics. I feel very safe. About that. <laughs> <laughs> Let's welcome Gary to his <laughs> So, Gary, mom we don't expect you to do Monday morning quarterbacking on the video. Um, and I don't want this to take away from our primary discussion. Um, clearly the events in Memphis were deeply impactful. Given what we know, what are some of the things you have in place for your department to prevent such a tragedy? Yes, yeah, so first let me uh, say thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, and I will uh, kind of jump in with uh, Vice President Kathleen Anderson. We uh, watched that video together in our office uh, all along with some other colleagues of ours. Uh, and uh, there is nothing to say except for that was absolutely horrible. To to my, my How about this? About this. Yeah. <laughs> so let me say uh, that we watched that video uh, from the vice president's office. It was very, very tough to watch. Uh, very tough to watch. What we saw was horrible, terrible, uh, and uh, quite frankly, embarrassing for our profession uh, once again. Uh, <clears throat> there's something uh, to be said for a man, overgrown man, who, when he is in trouble, like Tyree was in trouble, uh, and they call out for their mother. Uh, there's just something to be said about that. It cuts right to the core uh, of everything. Uh, you know, you're in trouble. Uh, probably the most important person in a man's life is your mother, your father, siblings, but they call out for them. So that was very, uh, very touching. Uh, so to answer your question, <clears throat> we uh, we look at it from a couple different standpoints. We do a whole lot of training. Let me back up. We do an incredible job of onboarding officers 
basically making sure that we select the right officer for our department. <clears throat> now, sometimes that's painful because we have to say no a whole lot, uh, and then we have to start the process all over. But we do a really, really good job of uh, trying to make sure that we select the right officer for our department. Excuse me, so much so that we will uh, have people from our community, people from the bank community, like I see some of them in this room, who actually sit on our interview boards and we take their advice just as seriously as we take uh, you know, some of our supervisors and commanders who are on those boards also. Uh, so that's one of the things that we do to make sure that we select the right person. And then we go a little a couple steps further. During the onboarding process, we will take them, and we call it penizing. Uh, we will take them and show them the pen. So if we hire, say, an officer from Philadelphia or Abington Police or State Police, uh, we want to show them the way that we do police. So we will take them around to the resource centers, uh, let them have a conversation with the resource centers, uh, and uh, take them around pretty much our entire uh, university community. Uh, as I said, we call it penalizing. We want them to know how we respond to our students, faculty, staff, and the Penn community that we service the uh, community within our control factors also. So we do a really good job that uh, once we get them on board, we do a ton of training. One of the trainings uh, that kind of speaks to uh, uh, what we do in relation to uh, what happened with Tyree is called ABLE training. And what that is, it's active bystander uh, training for law enforcement officers. What that does is we are literally training our officers to, while they are in the, in the commission of doing their jobs, if someone gets too hot uh, for whatever reason, if they get too argumentative, if they seem to be agitated, uh, what the officers are trained to do is look out for one another. Supervisors are trained to look out for this also. And they are supposed to step in. We hold them responsible for stepping in in the event that their fellow officer uh, is getting out of control. Uh, same responsibility goes to the supervisor, right? Uh, so that program, uh, we were one of the uh, first uh, Police departments in this area to adopt that program they came on board, I think, in uh, 2020. Uh, so, all of our officers are trained in it. Uh, we have uh, some new officers that are coming on board. They will also be trained in it. Uh, we have policies and procedures uh, with the proper use of force, uh, which basically means you have to start down very low. Uh, and then Based on the circumstances that you're dealing with, you go up that level of, uh, of force. Uh, so our, our showing up, uh, the mere fact that an officer shows up in uniform is the, the bottom tier of our uh, use of force. Uh, so uh, with the policies, procedures, directives, training, and I have to say the next layer uh, that we have in place is supervision. One of the things that I did not see on that call, I'm sorry, on that video, was supervisors. It was not, not one supervisor on the first uh, video throughout all four videos that I saw, no supervisor in one location. I have to tell you, our supervisors come to peg stops, car stops, check on the well being. Uh, so you name it, our supervisors are showing up. We built that in on purpose, not that we don't trust our. Uh, officers, but it's nice to have the support of supervisor and uh, to ensure that things are going the way that they should be going. So those are some of the ways that we combat that. Mm -hmm. uh, hopefully that. I think one of the questions that brings up for me is, you know, nobody likes to get stopped by police and try to move on. Um, and so I have two questions. One is, um, what is the best way, if, if there is a such thing, um, to respond if you are stopped? And then 
is I'm stopped by a police officer and then another police car comes up. It is really intimidating. So how um, how how can we help people to feel more comfortable with that? Yeah, that's that's a very difficult one. I can tell you that uh, Scott and I were just having somewhat of this conversation over there. Uh, and what we both uh, kind of got to was that even as an adult, uh, even, even as a mature adult, I can tell you, I told Scott, probably 15 years I had been on the force before uh, I started having a relaxed feeling about seeing a patrol car line. Uh, so it took that long for me not to feel nervous. Now I'm not doing anything wrong, operating the car. Uh, but uh, so there, there is no direct answer to that. Mm -hmm. I can tell you that uh, I grew up in South Philadelphia uh, with uh, six, uh, there was a total, total of seven of us. I was the, the sixth child, four boys and three girls. I still have lots of nieces, nephews, uh, a few sisters that live in South Philadelphia, and the rest of them live throughout uh, the Philadelphia area with the exception with the exception of one. So I am in these neighborhoods all the time. Uh, my kids are in these neighborhoods all the time. I have an older uh, son who's 35. My youngest boy is 20 with a daughter 26. Uh, and I have to tell you, I worry. Um, did they get the speech growing up? They got the speech. And that speech went, hey, listen, no matter what you do, when you are out here, if you are driving the car, turning the lights on inside the car, hands on the steering wheel, you just try and be polite as you possibly can. Answer the questions. Don't be smart. Uh, if they ask you for identification, produce the identification. If you... Uh, if you don't have it, just uh, try and remain calm and have that conversation with the officer. Uh, so all of my kids got it, got that conversation. I got that conversation. Uh, I'm not sure if that conversation, uh, you know, is ironclad or does everything that it's supposed to do for you, right? Uh, you can have that conversation and you can do everything right. Uh, and these types of things can still happen. Uh, from the video that I saw, uh, they drugged him out of the car, uh, placed him onto the ground, and shouted uh, directions from all angles. And be like three or four people shouting. <clears throat> and he sounded as if he was cooperating, uh, and he was actually quite calm. Uh, I didn't see one form of aggression uh, coming from that person uh, throughout the entire the entire video. Uh, so, yeah, so the answer to that question is, I think you can prepare as much as you possibly can. And I would like to think that, you know, under normal circumstances that uh, we don't put ourselves in harm's way uh, if we uh, do the right thing with those uh, encounters. Uh, but I can tell you myself, uh, growing up in Philadelphia, I've had multiple encounters that probably shouldn't have gone the way that they, they went. Something that and we kind of deal with that as a society. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I don't want to um, spend a whole lot more time with this. Um, I want to invite our other panelists up. One of the things that, um, that one of the reasons we're having this conversation and one of the things I know is that um, the Penn police, at least on campus, I, don't, I can't speak for what happens in the community, spend a lot of time developing relationships. And I think that um, that's something that has been really important um, as we move through. Um, I remember when I was in high school, it was a police officer at the high school. I still remember him. His name was Officer Reese. We called him OR. And he spent so much time just talking and developing relationships with us that you know, if there was something going on, he all you know, he knew most of us. Or we could say, um, Darren, now you know better than that. You know, and I think that it's so important to have those kind of relationships. 
which brings us to some of the discussion we want to have today about how you form partnerships. So I'd like to invite our other panelists up. Um, our first panelist, our second panelist, is Margaret Livingston. She is the president of Walnut Hill Community Association, born and raised in West Philly, West Philadelphia, attended the Henry C. Lee School, as I did also, I like her there, <laughs> and the Philadelphia High School for Girls. Always having a desire to teach, Margaret received a Bachelor of Science degree in Education and a Master's degree in Educational Administration. She worked for 35 years at the Sharswood Elementary School. During her tenure, she was a special education teacher and later became the, became the Dean of Students and Special Education Liaison. Margaret has been block captain for the 4600 block of Locust Street for over 30 years. She proudly wears the nickname, the mayor of Locust Street. <laughs> <laughs> she, was a, she was instrumental in getting yard ladders for the residents through a grant provided by UC Bright and University of Pennsylvania. She organized her residents to participate in the Philadelphia More Beautiful Contest in 1995, where they placed first. Mm -hmm. um, she is also a woman of color Honorary. Yes. So thank you for joining us. I'd also like to invite Scott Hilkin up. He is the director in the Office of Social Equity and Community. Scott serves as a director in the Office of Social Equity and Community, an office created by former Penn President Amy Gutman to support the university's pursuit of justice and equity on campus in Philadelphia and beyond by working to name and overcome systemic barriers while building awareness, connection, and understanding. Prior to joining the Penn community, Scott spent the better part of two decades mentoring students and supporting faculty throughout the Rockies and the Northwest. Motivated by a growing commitment to fight racial injustice, and historic inequality, Scott was eager to return to Philadelphia in the fall of 2020 to join the SEC team, social team. An East Coaster at heart, who grew up in Delaware, he spent most of his adult life in Boulder, Colorado, with his wife, Jane, and three kids. He earned a Bachelor of Arts in Psychology at Wheaton College and Master of Divinity at Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminary. Join me in welcoming our campus. So I was saying that um, one of the things that I know that um, University of Pennsylvania Police Department spends a lot of time building community and building uh, relationships. And so, um, Margaret, I'm going to go to you first. Okay. <laughs> As president of the Walnut Hill Community Association, what does your organization, I don't like the way this is working, I'm changing it. <laughs> what does your organization do to build relationships with public safety entities in the area? Okay, um, first of all, let me thank everyone for having me come today. I want to thank uh, Vice President Kathleen Anderson and uh, the letter that she read today, uh, she sent to me several days ago on an email, and I immediately put it on our community website because that was something that the community should read and hear as far as how the University of Penn feels about what happens. And I did convey that to her saying, we were putting that immediately on our website. But, um, we have community meetings, we have board meetings, and it's an ongoing conversation with Penn Police where they are always part of our board meetings and they are always part of our community meetings and vice versa. Um, because of that, uh, more Vice President Maureen Rush, who is now retired, asked if I would join the uh, Division of Public Safety Board. Mm -hmm. And I immediately said yes, because that was another way of me conveying concerns in the West Philadelphia area to Penn Police. 
and also getting information that is happening with Penn Police to our community. So uh, it's an ongoing back and forth conversation, and I am thankful to be president of the Walden Hill Community Association and taking part in conveying information, especially to our youth who need it and to our seniors who are struggling right now uh, in the West Philadelphia area with the gentrification that's going on and the affordable housing. So all of those are uh, concerns. So not only with uh, the Penn Police, I also am on the University City District Board where um, they convey information to me as far as what's going on with their life skills program you know, with the youth. So it, I try to engage and stay in tune with everything that the University of Penn is doing so that I can, in turn, send that information to my community. Thank you. Um, could you just, just push a little further? If you were advising other community groups and community organizations, um, how would you advise them to begin a dialogue and to develop relationships like you have developed with um, Penn Police with other police departments? Well, I would say basically get involved, know the Penn Police. I think that's how it started with me. Um, my son worked for or is working for the Penn Police. And I think that is what drew me towards finding out more about what is happening with um, the University of Pennsylvania Police. But uh, I am in contact with Spruce Hill Garden Fort, and they do ask how can we get more involved and getting more involved is just reaching out to the Penn Police, uh, reaching out to the University City District and finding out how they can uh, get more involved and find out more information for what is going on in their community. Thank you. Um, Scott, I'm gonna turn to you because uh, Margaret just shared some information about community groups. I'm wondering what advice you give to community members and specifically students to create relationships with public safety. So first of all, thank you for having me. Uh, Chief Williams, when I was growing up, I did not have that talk. Um, and uh, I'm quite aware. And it was when Michael Brown was killed that something changed. Uh, a friend of mine said, um, I just need you to believe me that there's something going on. And I realized, I was one of those white men who just probably said, well, what did you do? Or um, wondered what, you know, what the cops were thinking or what have you. And I realized at this point, I'm gonna change my action. And I'm just gonna believe what happened uh, was wrong. And, uh, if I'm gonna err, I'm gonna err on the side of the black man who uh, was hurt and not trust the cops. Um, and that was kind of the way I went for a long time. And that became a learning process for me and looking into the history of policing and looking at um, the kinds of reforms that would be necessary. And I am not an expert on reform at all. Uh, I, if you heard, I, I've been kind of a minister for the last 20 years. And so I enjoy developing communities and building trust, um, which is a big part of all of this, but I, I have had a hard time, uh, even as a white, trusting that cops are there to help. You know, I also get pulled over and immediately nervous. And um, so when you ask me, what do I tell students uh, how to build relationships? I don't say much. Um, part of that is it's a, such a dramatic power differential that I don't think it's actually the students' jobs. Uh, the students are in a position where they come in with history of the uniform. Um, they're nervous about it. They they don't trust the uniform very much. And um, for me, especially as a white man, to say, ah, trust, trust them, go ahead, get to know them. I, I would lose my credibility pretty quickly. Um, 
Uh, so I'm pretty cautious. Um, I will say that from everything I've learned, you not only have the best police force in the university setting, but maybe in Philadelphia, um, my desire would be that the rest of Philly police would look like that. And then I would have a lot easier time um, advocating. Uh, but I I think it's on the uh, the onus of responsibility falls to DPS to um, fight for public safety mm -hmm. and uh, to uh, earn a voice with students uh, before I'm going to push them into that relationship. Thank you for that. Um, I totally agree with you. <laughs> um, because, you know, how do you begin to develop trust? How do you gain their trust? And, and you're right. I think anybody tell them, oh, go, go, and just trust it with lose some credibility. So I'm going to come back to you sure, and sure. say, so how does your department take steps to develop community with the students and with West Philadelphia? Good question. Uh, first, uh, thank you, Scott. Uh, our police department is great police department, but that is not my, my doing. It's safe, collective, it's uh, that got us there, uh, and that has kept us there over the years. <laughs> so uh, we are constantly trying to build those community relationships uh, with our faculty, our students, our staff. I can remember quite a few events uh, that we uh, hoped our students up with, with uh, and police and our faculty. Uh, one was, when it comes to mind, there's, there's a fraternity called ATO. I believe they're at the the house at 39 with the focus, 39 and Walnut, and Walnut and Lotus. <clears throat> Shoot a band volleyball court here. And we were doing some outreach, trying to, you know, get uh, some students involved uh, with some of the community uh, and with the uh, and police uh, officers. So, Pal, let me back up a little bit. Pal uh, stands for Police Athletic League. Basically, what that is, it's a <clears throat> it's a program. It's a national program. I think there's about 20 plus centers in Philadelphia. Uh, we happened to support one for many, many years before I became a police officer. Uh, and what it is, is it's tops healthy kids. Uh, so we have dedicated over these many, many years. And as I said before, I got to, um, and we dedicate one of our police officers to this power program. And that is their full-time job. They work with kids full-time. The only time that they would report back to us is vacation, sick time, you know, organizing some, some, uh, administrative things, but uh, during the school year, it's a after-school program, uh, and during uh, the summertime, it's a day program, but it's a great commitment, uh, I think, from our university uh, and any uh, other entities that uh, have these, uh, support these PAL centers, have them up and running. Uh, PAL is a wonderful organization. They do a bunch of things with kids, computer labs, positive imaging, uh, a host of sports uh, activities, uh, introducing them to ice skating, introducing them to field hockey, golf, basketball, you name it, they introduce these kids. And sometimes these, uh, these kids may not have that opportunity to get introduced uh, into uh, something like that. So uh, that is one of the uh, ways that we try to move at least some of our students uh, into it. So ATO held a great event. They brought a bunch of pizza. They brought out their uh, fraternity brothers and they were helping to show the kids how to play volleyball. It's a great afternoon. I think it was about a four hour event, uh, which, uh, which was very good. Uh, another event was a flag football uh, event that we hosted. Uh, we also got a couple of fraternities of our member, the uh, fraternities. Off game anymore, but uh, they participated. They uh, they uh, organized it, worked with us. Uh, we brought in some pal kids from uh, some different centers, including our Tucker Pal Center, and it was a great event. But I have to tell you, on the student side, it's very difficult. Uh, you know, they they're studying, uh, and it isn't very easy uh, to get through. There's a whole lot of uh, 
footwork to to get done. Uh, and plus, you know, they had their own social life. Uh, and they're only here, hopefully, for four years, and not five uh, or six. Uh, so it's uh, it's a community that, that's constantly moving on us. So we may hook some in, uh, and and they may participate, but then they're you know they're they're graduating, they're gone. We have to do the same thing and repeat. Uh, on the community side, I believe I met uh, Margaret at a Walnut Hill meeting a very very long. Uh, time ago, I think I was a sergeant at the time. Uh, so we've been committed to uh, going to uh, the different community group uh, meetings for a very, very long time. Now, uh, for those of you who don't know, if this is Penn, these uh, community organizations don't necessarily touch Penn uh, or Penn, uh, Penn's patrol area. Uh, sometimes they're out. Uh, so there's Cedar Park in Spruce Hill is, is still there, Walnut Hill. So there's a quite a few of them. And what we do is we task at the time, it was myself uh, and I believe Officer Taylor, uh, with going out, sharing some information about and <clears throat> and then uh, Walnut Hill and the other groups would share some information also. And we would liaison back and forth. I'd bring that information back and say, hey, here are some of the concerns from the Walnut Hill group or the Spruce Hill group, uh, and that, that information go back and forth. So that is uh, yet another way that we try and do that. Uh, we uh, have partnered with uh, St. Ignatius uh, on the north uh, side of Market Street for tour drives, uh, for back to school uh, drives. We are looking forward to partnering with our, our good friends at Christ Community across the street from us. Uh, we have uh, had uh, several different conversations about the possibility of uh, doing some community partnership. So we're always, always looking for opportunities. Uh, if anyone knows of any uh, that we can uh, be a part of, please let us know. Thank you. So I want to go back to you, Scott, because. Um, I know that we can't just tell students to trust and to, to step out there, but are there any um, programs or activities that you do that could help to build bridges between students, student groups, and uh, public safety? And let me just, before I go, because I keep going back and forth between saying public safety and the police department. Use your cigarette. <laughs> So I just, you know, I'm going to ask you really quickly, what's, you know, so what's the difference between public safety and police department? Ah, so public, uh, public safety is a division and it's made up of seven different uh, departments. Uh, and head police is one. Now, I happen to think that it's the most important part of our division. Uh, it's definitely one of the larger parts, but uh, our boss, uh, BB Anderson, may not uh, agree with you. Uh, <laughs> and neither may some of the other directors who are, you know, <laughs> but uh, so, yeah, so the difference is in police, we are uh, the police department and we are one way in that set uh, with the division of public safety. Thank you. So, back to my original question. Yeah. Are there things that you do to build bridges? So, I, I lead a fellows program with eight undergrads, and they tend to be more uh, students who are out and looking to make a difference. Um, they weren't they weren't sleeping on uh, college green, but last uh, last season, but they were in support of the students who were doing so. And so we end up spending a lot of time having conversations about what's happening there. And uh, I think the undergrad mind sometimes gets kind of myopic about what's happening, <clears throat> make assumptions about what's going on and being able to ask questions about what they understand about that situation and expanding their understanding of, of who's involved and uh, being able to talk about experiences that I've had um, with, Captain McCoy, uh, the best president shield for um, my experience with officers at Penn. And also then opening up the opportunity for the possibility of things might change. Mm -hmm. uh, my family's coming into town next week, uh, this weekend, and 
I promise you, I will act like a junior hire the whole time because I will fall back into my old mode and everybody else will do the same. We will all kind of treat each other like we used to. Um, we've all grown up. Uh, we're all doing different things and we need to allow ourselves uh, that, but also to allow one another to. And I think the students need to allow companies to do better than oh. their homeboys mm. might have uh, mm. done. And that the uniform might be different and maybe not get lots of trust, but open up the possibility that um, things could be different. Thank you. Are there any ladies that uh, pedigrees have helped um, to meet the needs of the community that you served? And are there opportunities to expand the relationship? I don't have a good answer to that. Okay. I'm not aware. They, I think probably they quietly support us behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. Do you think that there are some ways that they could help to expand um, the relationships and to support the relationships with students. Sure. Again, <laughs> put you on the spot. These are hard questions. <laughs> I mean, relationships are built on trust, mm -hmm. and trust takes time, and it goes back and forth. Mm -hmm. And um, again, there's a power difference. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, this was a king of it. Uh, Power without love is abusive uh, and reckless. Yeah. Um, so let's exert power in a loving way to students. Um, and let's let students know when that happens and tell about it, talk about it, open, tell a different story. And uh, when we know stories we tell impact uh, what we know. Uh, if I can discuss, so I don't want to take over. Um, <laughs> But, um, you know, as the representative for the entire division, um, like Gary's Ray, um, uh, I do think that we're more than just the police. Um, uh, uh, you know, part of our mission as an entire division, police are uh, uh, certainly the most prominent uh, mm -hmm. part of our division, but um, part of the entire mission of the entire division is to help build that trust, right? And we take that for the entire division, not just the police. So whether it's special services, if I see, you know, uh, one of our, our other special services or our allied universal officers, um, you know, trust comes from, from consistent um, uh, interaction. And I think part of kind of our mission is we kind of look at our path forward, you know, those and George world is making sure that we're having consistent conversations for the hard ones and, and, the, and the helpful ones. Um, and sometimes it's just being present without, without a specific means uh, to show support. Uh, and so what I think part of what our mission is, is to get people to know all aspects of the division, um, to rebuild, or start to build that trust. Being present, being supportive, being open, listening, um, and just like being part of what people do going forward. Because that's what I'm and, and if I can say, when I first became president of Walnutville, that was one of the main things that many of the residents uh, were concerned about. They did not have that trust with the University of Penn. And that's why we reached out to uh, the Division of Public Safety uh, to attend our meetings so that they can hear what is going on on campus and then our residents can ask them questions. So if it's an ongoing collaboration between the community and Penn Police, uh, just trying to build that trust because it, it, it was a struggle uh, 20 years ago when I first started Block Captain and then moving up to uh, Walnut Hill Community Association. But uh, through communication, uh, showing them what Penn Police can do with our community, uh, Chief uh, Gary <laughs> didn't mention that uh, they just gave our community organization during Christmas time 
boxes and boxes of toys that we were able to give to uh, the Breslin home, the apartments at 46 of Walnut Street. And uh, we let them know that this was from the Penn Police District. Mm -hmm. And so uh, it's an ongoing uh, process. Uh, before Maureen left, one of the things that I kept bugging her about is I wish Penn Police would just go further blocks up because you stop at 43rd Street <laughs> and University City District at least goes to 50th. And I, I keep trying to make that push to uh, go at least as far as University City District to 50th and hopefully, hopefully all the way to 52nd Street because that will also help build the trust mm -hmm. and it will give you more of a chance to work with the 18th District Police as well. Um, now on our on our board, I do work with the Division of Public Safety with Penn. Then my vice president and one of my other board members, Bernoka Michael, they both always go to the 18th District Police meetings, as I do with the Penn Police. So uh, we are trying to build trust and get information out and disseminate it to the community as best as we can. Thank you. Could you talk a little bit about, because you, you brought up the 18th district and the University City District and Police Department. How do all of these units work together? Yeah, I, I can probably speak to that. So, <laughs> so we sit within the 18th district, Police District, uh, and sits within that district. Uh, the 18th uh, Police District has the responsibility from uh, the river to 63rd Street, uh, Market Street, uh, over to like Baltimore Avenue. Uh, and we sit solidly in there. Our patrol boundaries are from 30th Street, the river, to 43rd Street, as Margaret said. Uh, we go out to Carlton Avenue to cover Presbyterian Hospital and then Baltimore Avenue. Uh, so we are the police department, not only for the university, but for every uh, person who uh, reside within that code boundary. So that, that means uh, uh, West Philly community in the Bushy City, we're, we're their police department also. And when that phone uh, call comes in uh, for police assistance, we don't ask, hey, uh, are you related to them? Uh, we, we take the call, we respond. Uh, and yeah, we do want to know if, it, if the person is uh, affiliated with them, but that does not stop our service. We service the West Philly University of City community, just like we service our uh, students back in the Thank you. So I have one question for all of you. Um, and that is, what's the most important piece of information that you would want the community to know about the police department? And that you would want the police department to know about your community? I don't know which one of you wants to go first. I'll take that one. Okay. <laughs> so uh, I think the most important thing that we would want uh, people folks to know is that uh, our police department is there to serve everybody. Uh, we don't care if it's a student, if it's someone from North Philadelphia who's traversing through the area. If uh, As long as they live within our footprint, and we have the ability to assist and serve them, we will do so. Uh, and uh, we're kind of proud of that. Uh, some people are surprised. Some people think that we are uh, just university and we only serve uh, university entities, faculty, students, and staff. But that is not the case. Uh, we respond, we handle car accidents, we handle a bunch of things out there, uh, you know, uh, all the time. So. The one takeaway that I would say is if you are in uh, our footprint in uh, 30th Street and 43rd, uh, on Palatine and Baltimore, we are your police department. And uh, if you work in the area, uh, traverse the area, you're here, you need some assistance, please call us. That's what we're there for. Uh, we're 24 7, just like the other police departments. We have a wonderful dispatch center. Uh, at staff 24 hours, uh, and we're just waiting for those calls. So please call us. Uh, okay. Okay. okay, so the question was what 
opportunities for growth? Um, you can answer that, but I was asking, what's the most important piece of information that you would want the police department to know about your community? That uh, we are a thriving community, uh, family community, youth involvement. Uh, what I would like to see is can police could get more involved with the youth in our area. I do know you stop at Blue Third Street, and for those that are out in the community, Walnut Hill doesn't start until 45th Street. We're from 45th up to 52nd Street from Market to Spruce. So yes, we are nowhere in the boundaries of Penn Police. Uh, that's why uh, what I would like, and I'll repeat it again, I would, I would love for the boundaries to move on further, uh, at least up to uh, to 52nd Street, and again with the collaboration between the 18th District and the Penn Police. So I would just like to plug our PAL Center. <laughs> we are we are trying to get our PAL Center up and running. Uh, right now, uh, we're working with another center on campus uh, and Sayre High School. Uh, I believe Sayre sits on the wall at the 58th and 59th. Yeah. Uh, so we're looking forward to a great collaboration and getting that PAL Center up and running. We would love to have some of the kids from all of their participate in that program. Yeah, and that's something that Officer uh, McCoy and I have had yeah. many conversations about a uh, PAL Center in the West Philadelphia area. And we just didn't have a building. So that's great to hear that the Nenner Center is considering the high school. Mm -hmm. So uh, with that, will you think about uh, providing transportation for the youth there? So that's a great question, boss. <laughs> no, uh, go ahead. Uh, so uh, Al does have, but uh, center has a, a van, uh, so the logistics would have to be worked out. Uh, in most cases, what happens is uh, youth are, you know, if it's a after school program, they come over after school. If it's a uh, you know the summertime program, and they work their way over. Uh, Al doesn't typically provide transportation to the centers, but I'm not saying no, uh, there's, there's a possibility that we could, we could work that out. Oh, yeah. I like to let it ask for what they want. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you uh, started talking about um, um, opportunities for growth. And so you just, you know, talked about having them do a little bit more outreach. Are there any other opportunities that you see? Well, whenever any programs or I think there's just any job opportunities that come up that uh, I wish you would, I wish, and I know you do, would consider the community and, and our, our young folks. And uh, I think just keeping them busy and giving them an opportunity to work and uh, have self-worth uh, would go a long way, and that would do great things for the University of Pennsylvania. So, um, just consider the youth in the West Philadelphia community. And I take that hand off, take that opportunity to say that the Police Department is hiring. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and they are, and we have that on our website too. <laughs> you know, if you have people who would love to yeah. uh, be a police officer working for us, please, please have yeah. those on our website. And apply. Uh, so hopefully we have some folks out there. Thank you. Uh, Scott, what's the most important thing you would want the police department to know about your duties that you serve? I will always defer uh, to Ms. Livingston, but I think some people feel overpriced. Mm -hmm. And so the desire for more policing out to 50 of um, not everybody would love that. Mm -hmm. um, and there are ways in which uh, people closer to campus feel like there are lots of police forces already watching. And I don't think we should underestimate what fear does to people. Mm -hmm. um, lots of people run for lots of reasons. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. People don't run just because they're guilty of something. They might run because they're afraid. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, a heavy police presence um, 
will it provide safety and insecurity at the same time for some? And so it's a really complicated dance. And I know you know this, so I'm not saying anything that's new, but to like to appreciate that dance together um, and to continue to develop the trust, which means character is the most important thing you can have when you're hiring. Thank you for the work that you do at the beginning and getting people on board with you, because character is going to having officers with integrity who are humble, um, who are learning along the way, um, who have a desire to serve, like you said, to serve people that they're caring for. Um, that's going to help us develop trust together. Yeah, so, yeah, I, I would agree. Uh, so. We, uh, the Penn Police Department is really good at handling a myriad of uh, different types of jobs. Unfortunately, the uh, 18th district is running from priority job to priority job. And I think uh, what Margaret may have been alluding to is, you know, having uh, perhaps some more police officers available to do some of the other stuff rather than running uh, to, from the emergency job to the emergency job. Uh, sometimes uh, the city of Philadelphia has to prioritize jobs. So if they, if there's a shooting, say, uh, up at 63rd Street, uh, and they're calling for service at 46th Street, uh, uh, the officers are going to go to the shooting. And that uh, automobile accident that, that's happening at 46th Street, say, uh, may wait for hours. Uh, so I think uh, that's part of uh, what she was alluding to. Uh, we have a very, very quick response time because we're not responding to all of those priority jobs. Thank you, Vaughn. You're welcome. Um, I want to open the or open to the audience for questions. I do want to put some parameters around it. Now, many of us have um, have had experiences with the police department, both positive and negative, and we cannot address individual experiences in this setting. But if there's somebody that wants to talk about something individual outside of this setting, let us know and we'll make sure that you have somebody to speak with you. So I have a question here. Yeah. I just want to offer um, thanks for the panel. So for what Mark and uh, DPS have done and three very quick things. Um, Ms. Livingston, in terms of employment for kids, this looks which on it that's available. We do have some pre-college programs. Pre-college? Pre-college oh, programs uh, run by Dr. Valerie Swain, Jane McCollum, West Philadelphia High, Overbrook, and some of the other schools. I'm happy to get that contact for you. And some of those programs come with stipends, but the idea is for them to go to college, not necessarily can, but go to college. The other thing in terms of building relationships, I had the real great opportunity to live on campus for 16 years with, with students. And one of the things the Division of Public Safety did, I'm going to do a shout out to Jean Janda, Chief, because the fire service for all of the college houses significantly important. <laughs> but the point I want to make, you know, the point, and I know you were cheesy, but the point I want to make is that the Division of Public Safety put a detective in relationship with each of our houses, 13 college houses. But when the, when the detective came to Du Bois College House, Du Bois, founded by Black students 50, almost 51 years ago, whenever the detective came, he just came as a person. They knew that he was a detective with the police department at that. But he took Thanksgiving meals with them, special events to just show up. And if they had questions about safety, he would answer them. So this kind of consistent engagement built trust. And so I think that that, that one is really, really important. And to Scott's point about allowing Penn police to give students a different experience, I think she Williams has heard this. I know the vice president's heard this of me. I'm, I'm from the South originally. Um, kid, little skinny kid who grew up in segregated neighborhoods down South in the 60s. Teenager down South in Louisiana, Texas, Arkansas, Oklahoma, and then the Midwest. 
my experience of police was not good. It wasn't until I came to the University of Michigan. And there was this real intentional effort to be engaged that my perspective changed. And I was a grown man in my 40s when I arrived at him. So those are three quick things I want to share. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you for hosting the panel, hosting us, and including us. I have one comment. I would love to figure out how to get those kids into Japan from uh, one I know. Uh, but I think that uh, we have some important stakeholders in the community, but I think that one stakeholder that I think is missing are the kids, or yes. are the students. So I think that's just uh, something to think about for the next week. Yes, thank you. Good idea. It's a delight to be here this evening as a former resident on campus and employee of the University of Pennsylvania. I'm familiar with so many cases here and know intimately how the police department and public safety works within the parameters of the college house system. And as Bill has said, it starts very early. I used to be involved in the training of RAs and BAs, um, resident advisors and graduate advisors in the police department, and the and the fire department were always asked to be sessions during that training. So that relationship began very early and extended to the students because, as they say, we also had those jobs mm -hmm. to each of the college houses. Um, so they got to see the police come in not just when there was a problem, but when they had questions, when they had concerns, when an incident occurred. But I had another question, and this is a more general question for Gary. Do you train your police, all of them, to deal with students, I mean, people, not only students, but people who have special needs? Yes, very, very good question. So, uh, yes. The answer to that question is yes, um, uh, we do. Uh, there's this training that the city of Philadelphia provides is called excuse me, CIP training. Basically what that is, is uh, it's a four day training course uh, that's developed for uh, officers to learn how to deal with mental health cases. Uh, for officers to learn uh, signs and signals when uh, they're dealing with, uh, say, someone who may have been in the military uh, and they may be reacting to, you know, the best that the officer has on. Uh, uh, any myriad of uh, situations, uh, people who are unhoused. Uh, so uh, that training is, uh, is very thorough. Uh, and it does equip our officers with the ability, excuse me, of uh, picking up signs uh, and signals. Uh, and one of them uh, may be that the officer is talking too loud and it's irritating the person. Uh, so kind of bringing it back down. So yes, we're, we're very proud of that training uh, and, uh, and our officers do participate with it. Uh, yeah, so um, we do a ton of diversity training. Uh, we try and do a, uh, a different diversity training every single year. Uh, uh, I know we've had the LGB, LGBT uh, resource center that we did some training with. Uh, we did some training uh, going down to the uh, Holocaust Museum. Uh, so each year we try and, uh, we try and do some diversity training. Uh, diversity is very important to us. Our, I like to believe that our Police department is made up of uh, kind of what what our university is made up uh, as far as diversity. Hi, <clears throat> my name is Courtney Back, and I'm an employee here at the university as well. But I'm also uh, the founder of a small organization here in West Philadelphia, community group. Like you, um, but I'm also blocking. Um, my question to you is kind of two prompts. I wrote it down, so I won't waste your time. Um, how often does you begin to review and assess uh, their boundaries? And when was the last time? I mean, the boundaries uh, that you police. And when was the last time that that was um, assessed? Yeah, uh, so I can tell you that our boundaries are set by a, 
uh, a uh, memorandum of understanding with the city of Philadelphia. Uh, so uh, they, uh, they're, they're city approved and state approved. Can't tell you the last time we took a look at, uh, you know, I, I don't have that information. I can try and find out for you with that too. <laughs> yeah. um, my concern is, you know, I live in as well. And um, clearly the boundaries have grown because everyone going, you know, is here understands and we're way past those boundaries. Um, not only employees, but students um, new past the boundaries. And so my concern is that I think that we're a little bit behind um, in addressing that. Um, there's no patrolling. Um, my community organization would love to work with you and other like your organization does anything that we do. I'm in the Vermont area, which is on the other side, as you know, of Lancaster. And so students are moving in the area very quickly. Um, there's quite a few employees, you know, grown tremendously. And so um, I would just like to put a bug in the ear that maybe it's time to reassess that with the city. Okay, uh, thank you. We'll take that under advisement. And if you uh, could leave the information, <laughs> we'll um, try and get that question in, answered for you to get back to you. Yeah, hi, I enjoyed the panel discussion. Thank you. And Glenn Bryan, head of community relations for Penn for the last 30 years. I remember when I first came to Penn, I got all the complaints on my on my desk about African Americans being stopped, um, black folk being treated bad by the Penn police. Uh, when I went to school there, believe it or not, they were running two police. No, we didn't have that. Just, we didn't have that. 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 We cut down on that dramatically. I, uh, from elected officials, I uh, get less from that, less from people on the street. Because I live on 52nd Street. Right? That, that's, that's deep in, kind of deep in West Philadelphia. By the way, Penn Police, you know, they're asking for Penn Police to go all the way to 58th Street, just so that you know that. I've gotten requests like that. Can't cover the whole city. Um, but uh, think about a 23, 24 year old couple having a child, maybe 30 years old, having a child that's maybe, you know, 17, young African-American male, afraid to go to school, afraid to get shot, uh, afraid of the police, and that's hell of a way to live. And that's what's going on out in the neighborhood. Um, it, it's fear. And all that. So I think I think someone just said something about meeting with the young folks. I think that was sad. Yeah, that's a good idea. We got to know what's going on. We're sitting here. We're wonderful. Man. Everything's good. Kids are, are are very fearful of of police, and they're also fearful of being shot. Yeah. Well, you know. Uh, you know. So I think we need. You know, that's something that we need to really be mindful of. Um, and, and, and maybe that's, that'll be a good topic for the future. Getting some kids in here because uh, gun violence is, is out of uh, control, and, and and also the fear of police. But our police have done a fantastic job. I, the complaints I get are few and far. I, I I got stopped once. You know, I mean, like wearing the red light. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. We have time for one last question. We have to wrap it up. A short question. Uh, the reason that I came here is for Ms. Livingston, because I'm from the Winslow Section, Winslow Resident Association, and we're trying to turn the Winslow Library as well as the Recreation Cultural Center into a community hub because we don't have any recreation center there. So I'm coming here to copy your ideas and to take them back to my community. I've already we create, I have a heart and craft room because this is interactive, it's, it's crochet and this quilt. So it's creating safe spaces for people to come and talk about our issues. Some kids may be afraid to go to a school setting because school is not practical for them. School causes trauma. So bringing it back into the community, making the community space safe, we can come in and talk about harsh issues like release 
condoms, uh, whatever is happening. And I always say it's not just a Philadelphia issue regarding the violence that is happening. It's a global issue. Right. And when people stop being afraid, it's a global issue, people. There are random acts of violence that are going to be happening. But we can create safe spaces in our libraries and our rec centers for the kids to come. And have issues not just for kids. I'm a senior. I want to be able to go to my local hub to deal with some of these issues that are going around. So I come and I volunteer for y'all sometimes, but just getting involved and also bringing the child along with you because this world is for them. Right. Yeah. Whatever we do today, all the conversations that we had today are for our kids. Right. We have to step up. Right. So thank, thank you for allowing me to come. Thank you, Dr. Bell. Thank you. So I just want to thank uh, our panelists and thank you all for being here. Um, Colin Powell said years ago that programs don't change lives, relationships do. Yeah. And I think that um, in terms of developing trust, in terms of removing some of the fear, in terms of working together, it's all about relationships. I may have gotten that from Maureen. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so if I might, I, one more plug for it was about, there was some vital information that I left out. Uh, so we, uh, as an incentive for uh, to, to hire the right people, uh, we are paying for, uh, we're reimbursing, let me correct that, we're reimbursing for the police academy. So if someone who puts themselves through the police academy and they come and get hired with the University of Pennsylvania's police department, we will reimburse that the cost of that training. Uh, I believe it's a four to six month yeah. training program. Oh, great. great. And lastly, I would just like to say, uh, truly, uh, if you're in our environment, we do see you as, you know, ours. Uh, we are your police department. We are here for you and we care for you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. All I want to ask is what's the age limit? <laughs> you don't have one. Well, you, you have to be able to make over 18. Right. <laughs> so, to everybody up here, thanks for your service. Yeah. Uh, we will hear two more voices. One I'm getting ready to introduce is Cody with an I, A Smith, and her pronouns are she and they. Cody Smith is a second year social welfare PhD student in the School of Social Policy and Practice, SB2, at the University of Pennsylvania. Got a lot of SB2 people. <laughs> yeah. um, their research centers community foundation governance and fiscal performance, while also broadly investigating the power structures of philanthropy. Before arriving to SB2, Cody worked in the nonprofit sector in a variety of areas, including capacity building, community outreach, LGBTQ advocacy, education, and fundraising. And where's Cody? Okay, y'all tell me. So far, we've had the opportunity to hear about what we hope to see change for our communities. However, now it is time for us to declare what we can change for our communities. According to the Merriam-Webster and Oxford English Dictionaries, partnership is a noun. But tonight, we're converting it into a verb, mm -hmm. an act molded by the mutual agreement and understanding of two parties who also hold shared goals. The goal of generating peace, the goal of operating with integrity, and the goal of delivering care. More importantly, as we come together from various backgrounds, experiences, and livelihoods, it is essential for us to recognize the assets of our differences, differences that propel us towards greater ways of seeing and knowing the world. Before we depart, I ask you to consider joining me in declaring our mutual decree. First, I will say the decree in totality, and you can decide if you bet you the afternoon. I will acknowledge the concerns of others. I will listen with intention. I will act on good faith. I will acknowledge the concerns of others. I will listen with intention. I will act on good faith. Thank you.
I do have to go to I myself, I'm humbled. I feel honored to be in the presence of such good people. We are in challenging times right now, not only on campus, but beyond campus as well. And we have to figure out what we need to do in order to uh, strengthen our partnership uh, and start looking at humility more, mm. respect more, mm. and the principles of love. Uh, those are some of the things that Dr. King um, echoed. Um, and we shared well, an MLK symposium, but we want to continue this. So thank you for that charge, um, Cody. We appreciate that. So we're at the end of our event, right? Come on, let's get some more. No, 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 we need to go out and start doing it. That's what she said. It's about a charge. We need to start making a difference, right? right. So I want to thank my director, Dr. Valerie Allen. She did a wonderful <laughs> I'm going to take the rest of the panelists up here. We got Gary. We're going to give Chief Williams a round of applause. We're going to give the community liaison, the mayor of 46th Street. Give him a guy over there, Scott, and give him a round of applause. Let's try to build this and spread this uh, rivalry throughout the campus and beyond positive uh, communication and positive partnership, okay? And, they and, they and the dialogue will continue, all right? Thank you. Thank you for being here.